I would say that we begin this year with an absolutely remarkable class of students that you're starting to teach and the transformative growth and the development that will occur as we teach and discover with them. And we're welcoming many outstanding new faculty colleagues as well. So we begin this year with great optimism, but we also begin this year after a summer of unimaginable news. It is a time of deep uncertainty and indeed fear, continuing uncertainty for many in our country and daily for many on our campus. The opportunities and the challenges that we face underscore the urgency, the relevancy of our shared mission, our work as faculty, as leaders, as creators, as innovators, as explorers, as teachers, offers the light in the darkness and promises and delivers on the human solutions for the problems that face us. As our colleague John Meacham reminds us in his book, The Soul of America, the division roiling our nation is not new. The divisions are not new. The hatred is not new. These are as old as the republic. They are in the DNA of the country. We have stood on the chasm before as a country, from civil war to world wars, to fights for equal rights that are in many ways being refought, beginning again. This is not new. Through all these challenges, however, American universities, they have had a choice to make. They have had a choice to make. They can turn and run or actually be part of going backwards to reinforce the divisions, to replicate the hierarchies, to breed more division. Or we can join together. We can join together for positive change, positive change in our society through what we do on our campus. Nassau Hall on the campus of Princeton University still bears the scars of cannonball fire from a battle in 1777 during the Revolutionary War. Think of it, as we sit here today facing challenges, but I think in pretty good shape. Before we even knew that we had something called this United States of America, this project, this project called America, called We the People, that project, that incomplete project, that flawed project that we still have today to work on, that we have the privilege today to work on. We had great universities. We knew even then that education was our strength. We knew even then that the optimism, the hope that rests at the core of teaching and discovery would light the way forward. And we know today, and we are reaffirmed today in this fraught moment, that we can, we must. We simply must join together, and we must fight for our mission. We must fight for our shared values. We must every day commit ourselves to demonstrating that we are that light, that we are that path forward that that project that began is still incomplete, is still deeply flawed, but we must commit ourselves to that. And on our campus, through these 10 colleges, these 10 schools and colleges, we must remain united as one, intellectually, academically, environmentally, as one Vanderbilt, with a compelling, set of values. I have it, you all have it. At Vanderbilt, 
we believe that education is the ultimate vaccine. It is the single most important predictor of any type of success. Look at income, look at health. Education is the ultimate vaccine. At Vanderbilt, we believe that trans-institutional academic research and teaching is essential to solving our society's greatest challenges, working together across field, across disciplines. At Vanderbilt, we believe that an elite education, yes, elite, I will say the word. And I will say it because in this day, they talk about elite athletes coming to schools. So why aren't our students who come and work so hard and study, why aren't they elite? Why is it okay to call a, a, an athlete elite? Yes, to get an elite education. But it must be accessible to all, and all must thrive. At Vanderbilt, we believe education requires the development of the whole person, intellectually, emotionally, socially, spiritually. We have this rare privilege to immerse our students and ourselves in an education that is human transformation. At Vanderbilt, we believe that success in our education and research mission is predicated on fostering a diverse community, but where all are truly included, where all have the opportunity to succeed and thrive and make good on the promise that we individually and collectively make to each young person who has earned his or her way here. And at Vanderbilt, we believe that every single member of our community, every single individual, students, faculty, staff, alumni, every member of our community, each is crucial to the mission of our university. And we can achieve so much more if we embrace, if we validate, if we appreciate that which everyone contributes. And if we work together, we can achieve even more. Now more than ever, now more than ever, it is our duty to marshal individually, collectively, synergistically, the power of these values, the strengths that we have against this series of challenges unrelenting series of challenges that are before us. We must seize this moment. It is our moment. It is our moment to carry Vanderbilt's mission forward. This year, please join me. I want to fight for our values. I want to fight together. I'm going to fight together for our trans-institutional programs. Faculty across the campus last year, they identified data science as a clear strategic opportunity. It was a similar realization that led to our first trans-institutional investment in neuroscience in 1999. This fall, we welcome Lisa Montesia as the Barlow Family Director of the Vanderbilt Brain Institute to continue to take us forward in brain science and mental health discovery. Lisa is just one of our new star faculty joining us this fall, including Nancy Carrasco, the new chair of molecular physiology and biophysics in basic sciences. I see the same potential in so many areas, but particularly the area that we have identified in data science to create a new trans-institutional data science initiative now led by Andreas Berlin and Doug Schmidt and we've already launched a new master's degree for 20, 2019. This institute will take on the myriad of challenges in this area. It will advance research all across the university. Research such as that of our colleague Sarah Igos, her book on privacy, which was cited and discussed extensively in the New Yorker magazine recently about big data's role in our constantly evolving, daily evolving definitions of so-called privacy. In fact, I thought it was fascinating the other day when someone said, why do you even call this a privacy policy? This is an anti-privacy policy. That's the question that we have to come to grips with. 
How did that evolve? How did it happen? What is the corrective? Think of research such as our colleague in engineering, Gautam Biswas, and the incredible work he and his colleagues do to use data to find solutions to transit challenges and pollution. We're sitting around waiting and looking at, well, what did the referendum do? What are the policy shifts that are going to come? We know they're going to come. What are we doing to define the agenda? What are we doing to leapfrog those things and come up with wholly different ways of attacking and solving a problem? We cannot get stuck in the day-to-day -day politics of these things. We must leapfrog them with the advances and the ideas that we are generating. We will join together and we will fight for our values by investing in the humanities. The humanities are essential to educating students who will go on to be thoughtful leaders and citizens. It's true. Look at our world. Is our world one shot through with values? With the balance of, I want to think of that more? Where is our society heading? We must reaffirm the central role that the humanities play. And the joyful lives they inspire and the wonder they inspire for everybody. I was at a conference and we had a consultant come in to talk to us about polling. And um, he said, you shouldn't talk about the liberal arts anymore. And we we're like, well, yeah, okay, kind of we get it. Why? It's like, well, you know, it kind of sounds liberal. And it's like, well, you know, it's like, well, would you want to talk about liberal, uh, liberalism and, you know, John Locke or, you know, kind of, well, let's have it. No, 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 that doesn't work. And it's like, well, and it was fascinating. And it's like, well, we'll call it, you know, a, 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 a well-rounded college education. Oh, no. No, 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 you can't. And finally, we just said, what do we call it? What do we call it? We've got to commit to these values and this path forward. Our success in the humanities is a foundation of this university. It is one of the strongest traditions that Vanderbilt has in rich scholarships in humanistic inquiry. And we have remarkable faculty, faculty like Peter Lake, who this summer was made a fellow of the prestigious British Academy for the Humanities and Social Sciences. This fall, driven by the Humanities Committee's manifesto, we will continue, continue to drive hard to advance new initiatives to elevate these core programs. I'm looking forward to our provost, Susan Wente, and our new dean of the College of Arts and Science and great colleague, John Gear, to rapidly advance these programs. We will join together and fight for values by expanding our global impact. This is not the time. This is not the time to put up walls, to put up barriers. This is the time for global engagement. This fall, we will move forward on our recommendations from our international study group. These include a new micro-grant program to support cutting-edge, time-sensitive global research and important creative expression to take advantage of strategic opportunities. We are planning our very next steps for a new Visiting Fellows program that will allow us to connect with prominent international figures in pursuit of collaboration and teaching. And faculty are developing plans for a new global institute that will serve as a hub for supporting global research and community. We must be a destination university for the best, most interesting, diverse individuals from around the world. We must be that destination, and we will make that happen. Underpinning all of the successes, the Humanities Manifesto, the International Study Working Group, our transit challenges, our trans-institutional programs is you, our faculty. Our shared governance model asks you 
for what are the plans forward? What are the ideas going forward? What should we invest in in these key areas? This fall, with your help and working with the Senate, we will support the recommendations from the Shared Governance Committee to further strengthen this process of working together. It's more critical now than ever. To expand our efforts to support faculty at all levels, we are now investing $25 million in a new faculty challenge. This challenge will establish new endowed chancellors, faculty fellows, deans, faculty fellows, and directorships. This plays off our very successful last year's Chancellor's Chairs Challenge. That was pretty good, wasn't that? I didn't even practice that. Last year, 18 donors responded through the Chair Challenge. And we are awarding them, and we will still be awarding them this year. I'm happy to announce the most recent of these, the Richard N. Armstrong PhD Chair for Innovation in Biochemistry. Richard, as we all know, was a brilliant, brilliant member of our faculty from 1995 until his death in 2015. And I have to commend uh, Larry uh, Marnett uh, for working so passionately with his family who wanted to honor Richard and created this chair in the basic sciences in his honor. His work will continue. His discoveries will continue. His memory is eternal. His work is eternal. Through this new faculty challenge, we're inviting our donors invest in our rising faculty stars as well. We can't ask our colleagues to wait. I'm 32 years now, I still don't have a chair. <laughs> we need somebody, we need support along the way. So this new support for our mid-career faculty will help us retain, will help us grow, will help us recruit extraordinary teachers and scholars who will be sitting there over the years and decades in this continuous commitment to discovery and teaching in an inclusive environment. We will join together and we will fight harder than ever by continuing to support our students to support our diverse students and to make a Vanderbilt education accessible and for all qualified students, regardless of background, regardless of income. This year, our class is superb. I look forward to teaching our students. For the first time in our history, the admit rate to Vanderbilt undergraduate school dropped 10, below 10%. It is the highest yield rate in history. It has the highest percentage of international students. It is tied for the highest percentage of Pell Grant recipients. And let's emphasize that. Let's emphasize that in a time of great inequality, of income inequalities. We can always do better, but what is the commitment of our society? What is the commitment of other institutions to saying, yeah, I wanna bring people who are marginalized and I want you to sit and learn and discover with everybody else. We can never, never, ever back off of that commitment. And there's, there's return on this. If you're virtuous, everyone wants to come. Everyone wants to come. We had a record of over 34,000 applications. If you do good things, good things will happen 
People are seeking out these experiences to connect across these cleavages that are only being reinforced literally every minute we sit here. Every minute we sit here. All these accomplishments are driven by Opportunity Vanderbilt. In 2008, as we faced the Great Recession, Vanderbilt said, we are going to meet 100% of undergraduates demonstrated financial liens without loans. Little did we know, little did we know the pain that would be inflicted on families through the recession. Little did we know, little did we know the economic disparities that would grow. But it was the right thing to do. It was the right thing to do. And now we see the benefits that it produced for the university and will produce for decades to come when these young people go out and transform society. In the 10 years since we announced that, alumni and donors have contributed $387 million to Opportunity Vanderbilt. $387 million. Princeton Review just ranked Vanderbilt's financial aid as number one in the country. And, you know, there are all these stupid rankings. Sometimes they do a happiness ranking. We come out number one in happiness sometimes. And I tell people, I said, you take a load off a family and you take a load off a kid saying to mom and dad, I want to go there, but will you take out a lot of loans? Maybe you'll get a smile on somebody's face. Maybe you'll say, hey, you've made my day. I feel better. And the kids I meet and the families I meet at commencement, I'm moving. And I hope you have this experience. I wouldn't be here unless Vanderbilt supported me. I wouldn't be here. Thank you very much. The gratitude, the appreciation, it's there. But you know what? It's our privilege. We're the ones who are privileged because they're in our community now. We're doing better. We're being better as an institution. We must keep the doors of this university wide open for everybody. Wide open for everybody. And if we don't do that, we really have to say, what is our commitment to education for all? We really have to say it's absolutely our top priority. We are only as strong as the diverse community we bring together and we sustain. It takes buildings. It takes places to nourish that community, to build that community, to do the work that's essential to what you do. E. Bronson Ingram College is now open. Work and planning underway. You'll see a big hole. You still may feel some blasts for the next three colleges, making West End uh, uh, a totally different place and look and a feel and an experience for our undergraduates. We are investing in all of our schools for physical plant. We are lucky to do this because we are able to make these investments. Renovations to the School of Medicine, the School of Nursing, the Divinity School are wrapping up or are going to be finished. Planning is underway for significant renovations to Peabody, which will transform beautiful historical buildings into modern cutting edge research and teaching space. We will invest in the sciences, in engineering, and in the humanities. I am pleased that the provost and the deans are coming together to look at new buildings and a trans-institutional plan for our next physical plant investments for science and engineering and for the humanities. This is essential. The faculty 
and the faculty senate are and will be directly involved in this process. You must define the space. These buildings are built driven by a theory, a hope of education that inspires you to do what you do. What is that space that you need? That's up to the faculty. Our work continues on our plans for a graduate student village. We are still in the process of working with a committee to evaluate the best location and timing. And we're actually working um, with some consultants and looking at other schools to say what might be the partnership that we might enter into to build residential spaces for our graduate and professional schools. We're welcoming the first cohort of 86 Russell Hamilton scholars on our campus, all with fully endowed scholarships of a million dollars each. We must build the pipeline of talented, diverse PhD students to become the future leaders in every field. I meet regularly with the Graduate Student, student Council leadership. We must invest in the lives of their development. A faculty committee recommended, and we have funded a Graduate Student Graduate Leadership Development Institute to provide state-of-the-art leadership training, mentoring to more graduate students to prepare them for careers in academia and beyond and give them the support they need across the university. It is essential, absolutely essential, to do this for our graduate students. We thought we'd get a break over the summer from the wrong-headed policies coming out of Washington, D.C. No, there was another effort to actually cut further on funding for students in the House of Representatives that would have made post-secondary education less accessible, less affordable. I mean, whose plan? Who thinks that's a good plan? Going to school? Is the American dream, American dreamers are a nightmare, is it a hoax? To do that as national policy and then also at the same time complain about global competitiveness? Or poverty? And not understand the power of education to transform? That's just wrong. That's wrong. It's wrong. We will continue to fight those. We will soon announce as well a transformative new scholarship program for our military veterans. The program will be supported deeply by philanthropy and it will serve veterans seeking professional degrees in the law school, the school of medicine, the school of nursing, the Owen Graduate School of Management, and Peabody College. It will be a transformative program. And I went to the University of Wisconsin during kind of the tail end of the Vietnam War. I think this country has lost the sense of Real shared sacrifice. You know, it's like, all right, well, you know, we're going to start a war. It's like, who's going to do it? I don't know. There's a bunch of people that signed up for it, and there's some contractors. I don't have to go to ancient Greece to talk to you about the city states, and that's not right. That's not what a democracy does, talk that way. These are people who really sacrificed, who signed up, who should be welcomed into our community, should be educated. And I think this will be a nationally recognized program. We will join together with our fight for our values by driving ever harder for our vision, our vision that it must approach some reality of a truly inclusive community. It can't be a vision that I see or someone sees. Visions disappear. Some people call them apparitions.
This must be real. It must be tangible. It must be something that we all commit to, each in his or her own way. It can be done collectively, but individually, that power is there in each and every one of you. How you interact with people, how you teach students, how you treat people. When you go to RAND, everything you do, everything you do. Our success is directly tethered to this value. If we are not a community that appreciates diversity, that includes everybody, that says everyone is going to have the shot to achieve, we won't succeed. We will not succeed. We will not innovate. We will not discover. We will not change the world for the better if our university doesn't embrace broad conceptions of diversity, recognizing marginalization, and start to change the way we think of how we did things before. Vanderbilt has always had to change. It always hasn't been real easy either. But if we don't commit to that, we have existential threats. We will not progress. We must also hear and listen from very different perspectives. Very different perspectives. I have the privilege of sitting on a stage to listen to Joe Biden and have him go on to bring the house down. Well, I'm just sitting there in a chair and say, well, he's the vice president. And I'm not going to cut him off. And then bring Carly Fiorini in. She ran for president. What does she think? Amal Clooney gave a brilliant senior day speech. But we had Robert Gates here as well, who has served a number of presidents in great service. We should listen to the different perspectives. That's why we came to the school. We didn't come here just because everyone would agree with us. We came here because we know that diversity of views, diversity of backgrounds is the driver for new discoveries and new teaching. I'm thrilled and I'm very honored that James Page has joined us as our new Vice Chancellor for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion and our Chief Diversity Officer. Our great colleagues, Andre Churchwell and Susan Wente led that search. And I thank the committee that brought such a wonderful group of candidates through and identified James with his experience in the private sector, in healthcare, at Johns Hopkins, as somebody who can lead us forward. We are privileged to have him here. You will love working alongside him to make Vanderbilt a much better place. I want to thank my colleague Tina Smith, who served as the interim so ably over the past year. This year, we will celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Women's Center. We will celebrate, but we will use this year as a time of reflection, a time of investigation of our own work on this campus, a time of redoubling our efforts so that the celebration is a recognition of what has gone on since 1978 but will define a path forward as well for inclusion and equity and empowering women on every part of this campus. It is absolutely, absolutely essential. We are a caring community. We are a beloved community. We will continue to focus on mental health. This summer we launched through the great work of so many of our colleagues, 
and faculty, staff, and students, a new student care network to move us dynamically and essentially into a more holistic view of mental health and wellness in our community. It will be holistic, it will be inclusive, and it will provide resources to all of our students whenever they are in need and make getting help much, much more accessible. Much, much more. Much, much more compassionate and inclusive. We are a human capital institution and we will continue to invest in you, our students, and our staff. This summer, Forbes magazine named Vanderbilt as one of America's best employers and as one of America's best places to work for women. Of course, we are proud of this recognition, but we can't rest on these laurels. We can't say, job well done. We need to continue to reflect we need to continue to look at our community and say, what more can we do? What's wrong? We'll never be perfect. We must commit to that. We're always looking for ways to engage and support all of you, all of the faculty and staff. When I was a young faculty member, we had two young children. And if it weren't for Vanderbilt Child Care, I wouldn't be here today. We have a new vision for child care at Vanderbilt. It is led by our fabulous new director, Kathleen Seabolt, a university task force with faculty, is studying the center services. And we are working on an opportunity Vanderbilt inspired tuition structure to say, why we talk and do in one area and brag about it, but we're not doing it in another area. These are our children. These are your children. Of course we should have some opportunity Vanderbilt for them. The goal is quite simply, if we're going to be the greatest university in the world, we're going to have the greatest childcare in the world too. It just makes no sense to me. It makes no sense to me. It's a big rotten gap in an institution's mission if it doesn't start caring deeply about everybody who's connected to the community. We have challenges that face our city. We have challenges that face our planet. We will join together and fight for the values as we, every day, through your work, your creativity, pursue a model for sustainability and smart transportation. I was in a meeting yesterday. We have almost 22,000 parking spaces on this campus. Our peers are probably a small fraction of that. 82 acres of our campus is parking. I mean, forget MRB1, MRB2, MRB3, MRB4. Parking lot one, parking lot two, parking lot, I don't know, put the sigma there, and then just go with the series. 82 acres with a land value about a billion dollars. You think I can grow land? Our land, our turf is our, is our most precious resource with the people. This is our home. We can be better than that. We can do better than that. For everyone. For everyone. Particularly our staff who are being pushed out further and have to drive in with crazy traffic. This is just not right. 
This fall, we will announce an innovative partnership with the state of Tennessee that leverages federal funding to make our aspirations for mobility and innovative transportation a reality. This is the result of a unique collaboration by you, the faculty, Mark Abkowitz and Craig Phillip in the School of Engineering, being global and being local, getting ahead when government is stuck. They're joined by Eric Kopstein, our Vice Chancellor for Administration, in envisioning a totally different way that we work and travel and commute at Vanderbilt. We will model smart, sustainable transportation solutions while everyone else is stuck. And you know what will happen when we do it? People will start to copy us. Because whether it's in medicine, whether it's in our benefits, whether it's our sustainability, people want to do the right thing, but they're saying, well, you know, we can't do that. And all of a sudden, it'll be, well, Vanderbilt's doing that. Maybe we could do it. Let's break the log jam. This is only possible because of the collaboration. The collaboration between you and your brilliant students. The collaboration between you and the administration and your students. We had a, a young professor and his graduate student come present to the management team on sustainable uh, 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 transportation. It was like a seminar. I think we all got a D. But his ideas will be the solution, not mine. Not mine. It'll come out of that laboratory. It'll come out of that seminar. That's where the solution's coming from. And let me say we joined together to fight for our values but we are able to do so because we have had strong financial stewardship. Today, we are exponentially, exponentially stronger financially than ever before. I think of 2008 and 2009. Where are we today? Thanks to the phenomenal, extraordinary leadership of Brett Sweet, many of you know and work with Brett, um, two years post the separation of VU and VUMC. VUMC is thriving on its own. We are thriving on our own. And I'm proud to say that the university has, continues to have the very least amount of debt of any of its peers. By multiples. By multiples by multiples. We have kegs of dry powder. We have kegs of dry powder. Our peers, not so much. Our endowment is the largest it's ever been. We had a record year for philanthropy in $170 million, not including the medical center, in new money and documented bequest. We had a strong bottom line, yes, we're a not-for-profit, but that doesn't mean you lose money. We had a strong bottom line of $90 million at the close of the fiscal year. And it's important to do that because that's what we reinvest in your areas and back in your facilities, back in your programs. We need that healthy bottom line. It is these strong financial results, the strong philanthropy, that have allowed us to fund 25 new Cornelius Vanderbilt chairs to raise almost $400 million for Opportunity Vanderbilt and to make a beginning down payment of $300 million on endowing all of graduate education. Endowing all of graduate education. Last but not least, we have to stand together and I must empower you and you must join with me by fighting for our values by telling your stories. And I need to give you more platforms I need to give you bigger megaphones. I need to wire you up to my microphones. We need your knowledge. We need your expertise. We need your thoughtfulness in the public sphere. Communication is central to our mission. I was sitting with Steve Ertel, our fabulous Vice Chancellor of Communications, and I said, we are a publishing powerhouse. We should be a communications empire. 
shout it from the rooftops. How do we do that? Why is this important? Even now, the false narratives that go around? But people still want reliable information. We get more calls than ever for interviews with you. People want to know, well, what does Vanderbilt think? And everyone's like, well, these universities, they've got this problem, this problem, and they're expensive, and they're, 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 they, they, they don't believe in free speech, and they got this problem, and they got this problem. Who would ever want to go there? Well, I have 34,000 kids who said they wanted to come. And I have you extraordinary faculty who come every year and recruit new people. 60% of Americans report trusting information from universities. Would we like it to be 80%? Yes. I would also you know, like to be 28 years old. <laughs> Ain't gonna happen. And nothing, nothing puzzles me more than when I go to Congress and I, you know, we have a wonderful delegation, but you know, I hear all the time, it's like, you guys got a PR problem. And I'm like, I got a PR problem. <laughs> I'm sitting in the Capitol told, telling me, I've got a PR problem. Your approval rating is 17% in Congress. 17% approval. How do you get elected? Because you gerrymander everything. We have so many people that want to hear from you. So we are doubling down on our stories and sharing those stories because people want it and our country and our world is in desperate need of it. What started out as a small set of gatherings as faculty salons where I call faculty together turned into a faculty-led committee that looked at this very issue and then came back with a series of recommendations to create a Scholars in the Public Sphere program. It will provide training and resources for faculty fellows to have the resources, to have the time, to have the training to more fully engage in the public discourse. I woke up the other morning, I opened up the New York Times online, and there's our colleague Jeff Cowie writing about America and patriotism. Might not agree with it, but you know what? He's in there. He's in the debate. He's in the battle. He's projecting his voice. He's trying to get people to think differently. We must do more of that. We must do more of that. One thing that has become absolutely critical to me, and it's the first time I think you've had a chance to say this, is voting. Voting. And I mean, I've got a list of grievances about a lot of things. And I go all the time, I vote if they you know, had a, a, a primary with no opposition. Too many people don't have that right. Too many people are having that right taken away by laws that are not even veiled efforts to disenfranchise people of color and people without power. So we're not going to vote? We're not going to vote? I was actually approached by a bipartisan, uh, our Congressman Jim Cooper and our Tennessee, uh, Tennessee uh, Senator Steve R uh, Dickerson helped spread the word about online voter registration. Vote! November 8th, vote! Early voting, October 17th. If you're new to Nashville, register to vote. October 9th. Yeah, one of the great ironies, our colleague Jim Blumstein moved here from New Haven, and there was a durational residency requirement to vote. And Jim sued, won in the Supreme Court. We owe it to Jim to vote. <laughs> and you owe it, if we're going to talk about civil democracy, try to go vote. Try to go vote. Every single one of us, every single one of us, faculty members, students, staff, we must be engaged. We must be engaged. We must be voices, ambassadors for the distinctive values of this Vanderbilt community and for the value of higher education and research, the very privileges that brought us to this gathering, the very thing that people are trying to deny to others. 
The very thing that is an incomplete promise, even for many students and faculty and staff who come on this campus. We must deliver on that. And we will. Because at our core, you know what? We should all be optimists. We teach and conduct research because we know there are fundamentally better solutions to the problems that exist. We know things can always be better understood, can enlighten, can lift, can transform. So I hope you'll join me to reflect this year on what it means really to work in education and research and to work in Vanderbilt. Why are we here? What are we striving for? What's our mission? What do we want to be known for? Let me leave you with a few of my thoughts. I want to be a community known for who we include, not who we exclude. I'm on a community known for let's try again, not it can't be solved. I want to be known as a community for building allegiances, not having boundaries or bigotry limit the possibilities of what human interaction can produce on this campus. I want a community investing in long-term gains with big ideas. Everyone else is twittering, you know, quarterly earnings, here's what I'm good at today. That's not us. You got a fundamental problem? We've got to think in terms of a decade. That's our privilege, long-term vision. We want a community built on civility and respect, not hatred, not fear, not division, not they're not like me, so I don't like them. That's wrong. That's just wrong. We want a community that through optimism, through contagious, collaborative energy, creates and deploys the knowledge, the ideas, and the leaders that drive, yes, positive change in this world. We're not a polyversity, we're a university. We're one. We can do it. Thank you for all you do for this remarkable community, and let's have a great year.